Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And I hope you enjoy this new show, whether you're viewing it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the episode. I do want to thank you for being part of my audience. You can also find links to videos or podcasts on MiamiGhostChronicles.com as well as where you can submit your story about any eerie experiences you've had, which I would love to hear about. Just go to the Submit Your Story tab. Please subscribe to our channel so that you receive notification of when we release a new show. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where I usually live stream and where I give you a behind the scenes look at locations where new episodes are being filmed at. I also tell you about all the interesting guests that will be appearing soon on Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you enjoy the show and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. How are you doing? And um, as per demand from a lot of you, um, I wanted to do some uh, shows based on some well-known haunted locations, especially if I've had a chance to go there. And, you know, I'm a big, big uh, proponent of research. In other words, <clears throat> when I, I hear about a certain location, whether it's historical or whatever, I do the research because I want to know what's what's really true. Is this sensationalism? Uh, is it really accurate? The reason why this is that a lot of people, it's not... Uh, to disprove what's there, it's because a lot of time, a lot of times, when I do research, I find stuff that's more disturbing than what's actually being claimed. You know, and you know, a lot of locations, uh, you know, they get that reputation of being haunted because they've got, got tragedy or or whatever. And sometimes the stories are either exaggerated or they're totally false. And then other times you find things that really did happen that it's like. I can understand why there's a haunting there. Maybe it's not who they're saying it was or the reasons, but God, this series of events or one event or these people, this happened. I can see why who, <clears throat> whoever lives there or have lived there, let's say if it's a historical location, keep recounting some type of paranormal experience, supernatural, even sometimes going back to uh, the land. You know, what was there before? And I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, the paranormal shows, not all of them, but a lot of them are going back in doing that research as part of their show because they this is interesting, especially when you are providing a basis for the haunting. And you know what? Uh, for example, uh, the show The Dead File. All right, as you, as you could tell, part of the investigation has to do with research into that area. And uh, Steve Deshavi, usually he reaches out to local historians and then he does his own research. And, you know, depending on how far back we're talking about and, and a lot of times they look, oh, they look at what's happened there you know, or very close by. And uh, that's why I, like I said, a lot of times it's not to disprove that there is something going on at a location, but sometimes to justify it even more so in just because um, they say, well, you know, this location is being haunted by whoever the owners or the family that lived there. And you find out nothing really happened or that story is not true, but this other thing happened, which is this very well could be the discarnates that are there that have been reported being seen. But anyway, getting to the show that I'm going to bring to you is a few years ago, you know, everybody's heard of Bobby Mackey's Music World in Kentucky and Wilding. It's very famous. It's been visited by a bunch of different shows. Uh... It's had, and it got the attention from all these different paranormal shows because prior to 
of the reality shows coming. It already had been established as having a reputation for being haunted. Uh, ever since, I mean, obviously, this uh, this location has been there. It's it always had that it hasn't always been Bobby Mackey's music world. It's been there for a long time. So, a couple of years ago, I had a chance uh, to go out to Kentucky, and let me tell you a little bit about that before we get into the story about the haunting of Bobby Mackey's music world. Because, to be perfectly honest with you, I remember the first time that I saw some show. I can't remember which one that was Italian. I was like, I, I, I that wigged me out. I was like, man, this place likes really sounds horrendous. Because remember, Bobby Mackey's music world had the reputation of being infested with demons and and there was a uh, m- several murders and uh supposedly had even been used by satanists and i mean that was like man this place is and they had uh one of the uh, caretakers carl lawson i believe his name was lawson that who has since passed away and himself was possessed because and was there was an exorcism i mean this this place has it all but and here is some pictures i'm sorry for my for my sniffling i've my 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 allergies today are having a good old time with me anyway this was back in august of 2014 okay and i went by there now unfortunately as at the it was at the wrong times it was too early it wasn't open it's one of those things that i went out there and my timing was off now the attraction of course was because of all the paranormal sightings that have been witnessed at this location for so many years now luckily though i was able to interview wanda k from wanda k's ghost tour now wanda k for many years had dj'd and then conducted paranormal tours over at Bobby Mackey's. Now, when, because we, we she, you know, she took us on a tour of another location, but we were really surprised. And as a matter of fact, we were the only two people there that day. So in a way we were, we had exclusivity to talk to Wanda K. She was a really sweet lady. And we were surprised when she said she no longer offered any tours because she felt that it was too dangerous due to the type of entities that haunted the building okay and she said that the area had a lot of death connected to it before and after a lot of the well-known stories of pearl Bryan and johanna and etc she described uh how she had been seeing apparitions that she felt were demonic and on more than one occasion had felt that something had followed her home now when we were out there like i said at the beginning one of the cave real sweet lady she took us on a tour we asked her a little bit and you could tell she really didn't want to talk too much about bobby mackey's and after we took the tour and she warmed up to us and i explained to her you know i've been doing paranormal investigations since the 90s and she kind of warmed up and she kind of opened up and that's when she told us this thing where she said as the years had gone by she had done less and less investigations and um at one point she would only take like a group tour i mean little by little and it got to the point where she didn't she would never go into the building by herself and it got to the point that she didn't want to do any type of tours in there period she stopped doing them she did not want to do them and uh she was very sincere in the way she expressed that she just really thought that going back in there would be dangerous uh in other words it wasn't even a question of whether she was a company unaccompanied whether you know she had a group of people there like uh you know somebody wanting to do a paranormal investigation it was like she did not want to have anything to do with this place all right and like i said she took us on a tour of another haunted house and she was fine with it it was great it was she was a fantastic fantastic tour guide now um unfortunately you know um like i said this was in august of 2014 that we were there and since that time right little after we spoke with wanda she became very ill and then she 
passed away on October 15th, 2017, uh, which is what, maybe what, six or seven months ago from the time that, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm doing this show. And I was very sorry to hear about that. Uh, I know she had had some serious health problems and I was very sorry to find out, of course, on the internet that, uh, that she had passed away. But anyway, I said, you know what? I mean, we, I said, I, I, I want to do some investigating as far as let's start with one of the most well-known hauntings that's attached to Bobby Mackey's, which is the murder of Pearl Bryan. And, you know, the, the, the story that, because even though there's other things that supposedly took place afterwards that also account for part of the hauntings, this is one of the earlier ones. Let's see how much truth there is into it, because it's pretty horrific. Uh, not only was there a murder, but there was, um, there was claims that it was done as part of satanical uh, rituals or ceremonies. And you'd be surprised what I found out. Not exactly the way it's been described, but to me personally, a lot more disturbing. So anyway, you're going to see that what happened with Pearl, part, part of the story is based in fact, but there's more of a mystery to it. Uh, and also it brings into question just to exactly who is haunting their Bobby Mackey's. But for today, we're only going to be looking at Pearl Bryan's death. Now, uh, as you know, this was, the building has been there for quite a while where Bobby Mackey's is at. And, um, but it's, there's different incarnations of that location. Now, one thing it never was, was it was never a slaughterhouse. Now, let's go back to way back. And the w way it starts is on February 2nd, 1896, a local paper called the Courier Journal wrote a short piece about the mysterious remains of a woman who was found beheaded in a lonely area about one mile south of Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Now, the crime was compared to the, a work of Jack the Ripper. And only five years before, H.H. H. Holmes had stocked the world's fair for his victims. And the year after that, Lizzie Borden's parents had been hacked to death in their home. Now, initially, it was suspected that she was an abandoned woman from Cincinnati, Abandoned woman being a euphemism for a prostitute. And law enforcement was unable to find her head despite bringing in bloodhounds to find it. Now, a soldier in Fort Thomas reported seeing a man and a woman walking out late at night along Alexandria Pike close to where the body was found. And a sergeant claimed that he had heard a woman scream around midnight. Now, what's really interesting about this is, obviously without the head, they couldn't identify who it was. But initially, the police were like, oh my God, it's a beheaded woman, whatever. But there was no big outrage, number one, because being so close to the fort, that's why they were thinking this was a abandoned woman, as in a prostitute close to the fort. Uh, and the thing is this, almost like in modern times, when the death is of somebody on the fringes of society, like a prostitute, nobody really cared. Nobody was outraged, even though this was not that far removed from when Jack the Ripper was stalking prostitutes in Whitechapel and Lizzie had hacked or was accused of hacking up her parents and H.H. H. Holmes at his murder castle in Chicago, not too far from there. So this was still fresh in the mind of the public. However, initially, nobody had any idea who this woman was. And like was assumed at that time, was well, she was a prostitute because of her lifestyle. Somebody decided to take off her head, probably 
and back then it wasn't looked at as in sometimes when we see it now where serial killer I mean that term wasn't in use then or cults or anything it was just seen as exactly what it was meant this is whoever did this just doesn't want this person to be identified they want to stump police and but everything changed of course and when does everything change when they figure out that this was not the body of a prostitute but was the body of a farm girl named Pearl Bryan and then everything changed so um, the murder of Pearl Bryan before anybody knew that it was Pearl Bryan was just thought to be a run-of-the-mill murder of a prostitute however the way it was discovered uh, as to who the body belonged to is very interesting and you're gonna see that I've included here some of the different newspaper uh, snippets and I put those in there just because you know I did extensive research on this just to prove that this is not something that I kinda guessed that this is basically what was being detailed in the local newspapers about a very grisly murder now how this came about the discovery as to the identity of the woman's body which in one of the pictures I know that the quality is kinda of poor it actually shows a detective standing right next to a body with no head on it uh, was that there were these very stylish unusually petite size 3 a size 3 cloth topped boots which the body was wearing now now there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Pook now Mr. Pook was the local shoe vendor and what he did was that they used the imprint and the numbers inside the boots and they contacted the manufacturer who confirmed that only one size 3 had been sent to a store in Greencastle and on February 7th the body was identified as Pearl Bryan the, uh, the location the store where she had bought them from was a place called Lewis and Hayes uh, and she was identified as the purchaser of that particular pair of boots because they were so small and again the public was riveted when it became known that the victim was a pretty country girl now and of course like all things everything changes because when you're looking at not only the murder but the mutilation a beheading of a country girl then that means any decent woman was at risk now it wasn't a fallen woman who because of her lifestyle had placed herself in harm's way and she got killed now every woman was thinking again all these murders Jack the Ripper H.H. H. Holmes now everybody cares when the possibility was like somebody's out there killing women and not only killing them but beheading them in other words a fiend now the brutality of Pearl Bryan's murder had far-reaching effects even to those with the best intentions who were horrified over the fate of this girl now the the gentleman mr. LD Pook who had helped in identifying her body through her unique boots lost his once thriving business and by July of 1896 in other words within a few months because he had ignored his business by devoting so much time to solving who those size 3 boots belonged to that he just the, the business went under he wasn't there uh, remember these were establishments where the owner maybe maybe had one or two employees but if he wasn't there to run it well he lost the business however and I thought this was very interesting this was not the end of Mr. Pook as an intrepid investigator because a couple of years later in January of 1898 the police department from St. Paul Minnesota contacted him in order to identify the murder remains of a woman using her shoes of course since all that was was left 
within her skeletal remains. And um, as a matter of fact, when this article came out, it was titled Another Pearl Bryan Case. And Mr. Pook said he had identified the shoe manufacturers and stated that he was sure the mystery would be solved. Nothing else was written up about that as to whether they ever identified who the remains of the woman were in the woods. But I think that what happened was that the police for the first time realized, wow, maybe we can help identify the remains. Even though in this case, apparently the woman had been dead quote, for quite some time when she was found in the woods. Now, back in November of 1899, again, this is within two or three years of Pearl Bryant's uh, murder, a young lady, uh, Now, and, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'm going to come back to that because we, we still haven't discussed as to who they were looking at for having killed poor, poor Pearl Bryan. Now, Pearl was born in October 12, 1872, one of 12 children born to Alexander and Susan Farrell Bryan. And they were a wealthy farming family who lived on the outskirts of Greencastle, Indiana. She was a music student at DePaul University. She worked in her sister Mary's dress shop in Greencastle. Matter of fact, one of the pictures there shows her in a group picture where her family was, uh, she was, she had some a good family behind her. Uh, she got an education as a music student. Uh, now, and this is what happens. Pearl lied to her parents when she told them she was going to Indianapolis to visit some family friends, but went instead to Cincinnati. This is where they pieced as far as her movements right before her death. Now, it was during these three days that events unfolded, which ended as she fought an assailant intent on separating her head from her body while she was still alive. Now, as the investigation evolved, it had all the factors that attract the public today. Illicit love affair, sex, unwanted pregnancy, drug use, double lives, and a violent death of one of the participants. And you have to ask yourself, was Pearl just a simple country girl tricked into thinking she was running away with her lover? Or... Did she go with the full intent of having an abortion performed? Because that was one of the things. Pearl was five months pregnant when they found the body. Now, bottom line though, it's apparent that she had run out of options because she was already almost six months pregnant, five and a half months when she was killed. And her, as a matter of fact, her torn and bloody clothing after they made that initial identification with a boot uh, they were brought to the family's home and the mother confirmed that they belonged to her daughter and also the fact that she had webbed feet which she had been teased about by her siblings when they were children. Now, you would think, okay, so how do we get to finding out who was being accused of this murder? Now, based on information provided by Pearl's family, uh, William Wood, a pastor's son and second cousin to Pearl, was sought out. He was known among friends and family as being Pearl's confidant and the one who had introduced Pearl to Scott Jackson in the spring of 1895. Okay, this is only a few months before she was killed. Now, Jackson quickly became a main suspect. When Wood was questioned by the police, and faced being charged with murder, he disclosed that Scott Jackson had led Pearl on after she had fallen in love with him. And Jackson had contacted him when she had become pregnant to help him get rid of the pregnancy because he did not intend to marry her. Now, during the trial, questions arose as to whether the father of Pearl's child was Scott Jackson or William Wood. Why, say you? Because both of them admitted to having intercourse with her. But Jackson claimed he had done so only after he was aware she was pregnant with Wood. Okay. So what happens is, and you have to understand, present day this would be salacious, but back in 1896 when this occurred, 
Salacious is not the word for it. What turns out to be the murder of a country girl, a well-to-do country girl from a farming family. It's obvious she's pregnant, very obviously pregnant. And then, guess what? William Wood, who's connected to her by blood, a cousin and a confidant, who introduces her to her would-be murderer, both of them point the finger at the other as to who got her pregnant. Okay? Because both of them had had sexual intercourse with her. And Jackson's saying, I know it's not my baby because I started having sex with her after I knew she was pregnant by Wood. And that right there makes you think, what's really going on? Are we talking an innocent girl that falls in love with the wrong guy, leads her on, gets her pregnant, and says, I'm not going to marry you? Or what was going on with her? Because based on what they were saying, she was having uh, an affair with both of them. Okay, now. So, I mean, right there, I'm sure her poor family, her parents especially, having to deal not only with the tragedy of losing their daughter, but finding out about what was going on with her. It must have been very, very, very difficult. Now, during this trial, okay, there was a Western Union agent by the name of A.W. Early, and he testifies that Jackson and Wood, in the months leading up to the murder, had exchanged various recipes thought to cause a miscarriage. Now, apparently, none of them worked, obviously, because she was so pregnant. And that was when plans were made for the abortion in Ohio. And Pearl was instructed to lie to her family in order to make the trip to Cincinnati. Now, Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling, who was his friend, were brought in for questioning. And they immediately accused each other of the crime. And friends of both Jackson and Walling hired a dozen imminent attorneys to defend them. What this means is both of these accused guys, which were later on, you know, the story about Pearl Bryan Satanist, these these were not country bumpkins, folks. They had friends that hired imminent attorneys to defend them. They were attending dental college. So, I mean, what was going on here? All right, this was not some sex fiend, you know, that the way they always portray them, that gets this beautiful, nice young girl, takes her out in the wood, kills her and chops her head off. Nope, that wasn't the story of what was going on here, not at all. So, here... um, like I said, they, they've hired all these imminent attorneys to defend them. Now, William Wood, the, the way that it all came about as to how Pearl met, you know, uh, Jackson, etc., was William Wood, which was her cousin, had met Scott after he had moved to Greencastle with his mother in the spring of 1895. Again, this is within a very short period. This was not many years. Now, they left... Um, he had left with his mother, Jackson. They had left Indianapolis after Scott got kicked out of dental college due to accusations that he had embezzled money from the railroad and was involved with prostitutes. Okay, this guy was not already... We're starting to come across some some questionable activities despite what that he was in dental college. But anyway, Walling and Jackson had become friends while attending dental school in Indiana and struck up their friendship again, sharing a room at a boarding house while they both attended the Ohio Dental School. Now, Walling was implicated because he had told Jackson of performing a successful abortion on a girl by the name of May Smith. This was a girl he had seduced. Afterwards, the situation was hushed up and no one was the wiser of the indiscretion. Now, I guess after they traded these recipes for miscarriage, that didn't work. 
they had agreed on Walling performing an abortion on Pearl and Wood acting as intermediary to pay Walling $50 for it afterwards. Now, as to why Alonzo's role went beyond procuring an abortionist to committing murder is not clear. Some stated that he was led into it by his older roommate, others that he was totally complicit in the planning and execution of a murder plan. Now, the autopsy confirmed that Pearl had a significant amount of cocaine in her stomach, enough to make a person unconscious, and in a ghoulish move, her fetus was removed and stored in alcohol in a peppermint stick jar and ended up at AF Goat's Pharmacy, where people paid to see it. Over time, it was removed from the shelf and its present whereabouts are unknown now that you hear that story about may smith just a little side story here now crossing paths with either walling or jackson proved fatal not only for pearl but for may smith in may of 1899 this was more or less three years after pearl's murder may smith commits suicide with an overdose of laudanum now, she was a tragic figure. It was reported that in 1892, her father had shot and killed her husband, but was acquitted of the crime since he claimed he had done it because his daughter had been betrayed. And then, in March of 1896, her brother Joseph Carson was scalded to death in a boiler explosion. This poor family. So, this girl, and in Amidst all of this, she's seduced by Walling and he performs an abortion on her. So, William Wood was charged as an accomplice, but charges were dropped when he agreed to testify against Jackson and Walling. William Wood, and William Wood, remember, is Brian's, Pearl Bryan's cousin. However, his involvement in the whole affair tainted him for many years afterwards. After the execution of the other two, he was shunned by all, including his parents. And he was forced to join the Navy and he served on the Iowa. And in July of 1900, he eloped with an 18-year-old girl named Blanche Daly, whose father had been opposed to the relationship. Can you imagine? He has an 18-year-old daughter who has formed a relationship with a man who was involved in this very, 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 uh, what's the word for it? Salacious and scandalous case where at one point he was considered one of the accused. Now, his parents were prostrated when they heard the news. And Blanche's father, who was the ex-auditor of the state and quite wealthy, claimed he was cutting her out of his will. Okay. Now, what does that tell you? That back then people had long memories. And yeah, you, uh, you could belong to a certain strat of society and like they said, his own parents, he was forced to join the Navy and he came back. He was much older than this 18-year-old girl, remember? And it was like people that, even though you were not accused or you weren't convicted, just because you were involved in it and you had, that you were accused of doing whatever you were being involved, that was enough. But believe it or not, things, you know, eventually got beyond it and it's very interesting what happened with uh, with William Wood after the fact. But as you could tell, this had ramifications for everybody. May Smith commits suicide. William Wood, for years afterwards, he's tainted. Alonzo and Walling, they hang. Now, as you can see, Poor Pearl 
whatever however it was that she came to meet them uh, in Cincinnati in other words that she lied about going to meet some friends and you never know which was she thinking that finally she was gonna get married in lope or was she really did she really agree and understand that she was gonna go and meet and have an abortion at five and a half and a half months which would have been truly truly very dangerous uh, now th that Jackson was the main perpetrator is apparent after a letter he wrote to William Wood was intercepted at the jail uh, among this group of friends Pearl had a nickname of Bert and Jackson's nickname was Dusty and this is what the letter read remember this is going to William so it says hello Bill write a letter home signed by Bert's name telling the folks that he is somewhere and going to Chicago or some other place has a position etc and that they will advise later about it say tired of living at home or anything you want send it to someone you can trust how about Will Smith at Lafayette tell the folks that he has not been at I and the letter is capital I which stood for Indianapolis but at Lafayette and traveling about the country get the letter off without one second's delay and burn this at once stick by your old chum bill and I will help you out the same way sometimes I'm glad you are having a good time sign D which stood for Dusty be careful what you write to me okay so in other words he's wanting somebody to write a letter to make it look and for have to go to Pearl's parents to make it appear that she's still alive and that she's just decided to go to Chicago or some other place in search of a job now from the moment that the body was discovered until the day Walling and Jackson were waiting to hang there had been a search for Pearl's head now two different testimonies were taken during the trial that Jackson was seen carrying Pearl's valise the day after she was killed the bartender at a local watering hall, hall called Legner's Saloon commented after Jackson asked him to store it if he carried a bowling ball inside since the weight inside of it in other words it was something inside rolling around the valise was found to have hair and blood stains and later analysis of this forensic material proved it had carried her head now detective uh, that were assigned to it investigating the crime believed that Jackson had brought the head back in the valise in order to cremate it in the furnace of the cadaver room of the dental college in those days dental students practice on corpses and the furnace was used to dispose of the bodies afterwards now Walling and Jackson gave different stories as to how the other had disposed of the head none of which proved accurate now Pearl's parents held out hope that their daughter could be buried with her head and they waited seven weeks before realizing this might never come to pass so she was laid to rest on March 27 1896 at Forest Hill Cemetery Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling were both convicted of the murder and hanged on March 20th 1897 their necks did not break during the hanging and they both took quite a while to die of asphyxiation now we get to the ghost reveal now first of all as you know one of the main hauntings at Bobby Mackey's was connected to Pearl Bryan Pearl Bryan the two men that were convicted and hung for it because supposedly they were Satanist and that her murder and that her head was thrown into a well that they do have a well there I believe in the basement 
of Bobby Mackey's. The head that was never recovered and that this was all a ritual killing. But in truth, no mention was ever made about Satanism, cults, rituals, or anything like that. At the time of Pearl's murder, everything revolved around a girl that was inconveniently pregnant and a murderous guy who decided to, if he couldn't have her miscarry the baby, then he was not going to marry her. He'd rather kill her than marry her. And the truth of this also, Pearl was beheaded about four miles from Bobby Mackey's. And the Honky Tonk was never a slaughterhouse, which was in the area and had already been closed by the time of her murder. In other words, there had been a slaughterhouse close by. But as you know, this is right on the Licking River. and But by the time of her murder, this slaughterhouse, which was never at that location of Bobby Mackey's, had already closed down. Matter of fact, those wells at Bobby Mackey's are for a distillery that was on the site and water was being brought in, not used to move waste to the Licking River. Again, there's no mention of occult practices in the area tied to Pearl's death or for that area at all. Being sacrificed as an offering sounds much more sinister, but poor Pearl lost her life because she was foolish and in the end, proved to be an inconvenience to a psychopath. Uh, now the question begs to be asked, why didn't Scott Jackson just marry Pearl, who was very pretty, came from a wealthy farming family who had already indicated that he would be accepted as her husband because believe it or not, they were being looked at as like, this might possibly be, in other words, Pearl's bow. Remember, they had 12 kids. Now, it's uh, it's obvious. It's a scary story. But if you go by the research as to who's haunting Bobby Mackey's, believe me, and I'm going to do a follow-up show on this on all the other things that have happened. This is a matter of fact, not too far from Bobby Mackey's. Within those years, there was a huge loss of life when a bridge that was being built collapsed and a lot of men got killed that were working on the bridge. This was right close to where Bobby Mackey's is at. And I'll do a follow-up show on that. But again, that... Pearl was sacrificed by Satanists? Not accurate. That it got a lot of press coverage, of course. A farm girl gets murdered five and a half months pregnant. Two of the men that are convicted are dental students from fairly well to do families or, you know, recognized in the in society. At the end of the day, disturbing? Yes. That she might be one of the ones haunting Bobby Mackey's? Nope. But that there could be a lot of usual stuff. Because, again, I'm going to. When I spoke to Wanda K., this lady was serious. She had been doing paranormal tours. And we discussed it. I mean, in other words, she wasn't talking about your run of the mill, regular, old um, haunting, you know, dead people. She really was concerned and scared, and I, she used this word, she thought it was dangerous. Dangerous for herself and dangerous to take anybody over there. In other words, the way she saw it was, I'm not going to go back in there for any reason, and I am not don't want to be in charge of taking anybody over there because I think they're going to be in danger too. It wasn't like, it's just danger for me, it's danger for anybody. And yes, that's my notifier. Um, and... That there's and and what she was concerned about was what I what I've spoken about in other shows as a non-human entity, demonic. She she described certain things to me that were pretty disturbing, and I don't blame her for not going back. Um, but we're gonna get that in another show as to who or what did occur there that most definitely could be part of why 
Bobby Mackey's has the reputation that it does have as being a very haunted location. So again, guys, I hope you like it. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, get your notifications. And thank you so much for being part of my audience. You guys are great. Take care.